pray that you bless this day. Pray, Lord, that you would give us all, Lord, a blessing from thy word. And as we continue our study through the prophetic uh, timeline, I pray that you bless all that I say today. Let it bring honor and glory to thee, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the kids can go ahead and be dismissed. All right, so we are on the tail end of a study that began about, um, I don't know, three months ago. We started at the beginning of time, and now we're going to go out through the end of time, although there's really no beginning of time and no end of time. But as far as man is concerned, man had a beginning. The angels had a beginning. The earth had a beginning. Baseball's mentioned in the Bible. Genesis 1 1. If you didn't know that, baseball in the big inning. Uh, speaking of big innings, the Pirates lost 21 to nothing yesterday. Uh, that is a pitching ex exhibition, if you will. That was the worst loss in the history of the Pirates franchise. And they've been around for around 150 years. So 21 to nothing to the Chicago Cubs. So if you're wondering if, if baseball is in the Bible, it's in the big inning, if anybody ever asks you. Uh, I, find, I find that to be funny. But anyway, my sense of humor is not everybody's sense of humor. I get that too. Uh, but everything except God had a beginning. Now, when you talk about <clears throat> beginning all the way through <clears throat> in the middle, we looked at the beginning of man through uh, Adam to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, to David, to Christ. We went through all of that timeline. And then we checked out the church age. And we've ridden this all the way up to where we are in history. And we would be in what we call eternity present. Eternity present. So it's here. There's eternity past, and there will be eternity future. Now, the reason I said all this is because everything except God had a beginning. Some of it will have an end, but man will always go on, okay? Man's an eternal being. Once you're born, you're an eternal being. Regardless of people say annihilation, they say you go to the grave and that's it. No, we are eternal beings. That's why it's imperative to make your choice for eternity while you're here on earth. That's the way God meant it to be. And we just had the Easter service where we know Jesus came. He died. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. And because he lives, we will live. And those that don't accept him as their savior will not live eternally. They will die eternally. And I know that sounds really odd. How can some, something die forever? but it's a state of eternal, eternal damnation. And that's why when you, if you're listening to this and you think about how important it is to receive Christ as your savior, it's the most important decision you will ever make. The decision to buy a house pales in comparison to that decision. The decision to get married, the decision to buy a car, the decision to move uh, to a new location, the decision to choose a job, a career, Every one of those decisions pales in comparison to a decision to accept Christ as your Savior. There's no greater decision that a person can make. Because once you do it, you seal your eternal destiny. Seal it. And you think about man. Forever and ever and ever, man will go on. Now you say, well, the flesh is going to die. Yes, but we have an eternal spirit, eternal soul. And one day it will be linked back up to that flesh. And that's what I've been talking about. So if that brings conviction to you today, and if you're listening to this either here or there or somewhere later on, and you get convicted and say, oh, boy, I'm in trouble. I don't know where I'm going when I die. You are in trouble. You seriously are in trouble. And you need to make it right with God. God sits there with his hands wide open. Come. Come. Come one, come all. Amen. And it's free, without money, without price. There is nothing. Just come. Just come and repent. Lord, I'm sorry, and I want to be saved. I want my name to be in the number. Come into my heart. 
be my savior, seal my eternal destiny. And when it's heartfelt, the Lord says, I see that, I will save you. He will never, that's the one prayer, God will always answer. Think about it. One prayer, God will always answer because the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And how important that is to come to repentance. Now, here we are. We're in eternity present. So what's coming <clears throat> will be eternity future. The next great event we're waiting for is what? <clears throat> the rapture of the church. And then we go into the tribulation. Seven-year tribulation. <clears throat> and at the end of the tribulation is a battle called the Battle of Armageddon. That's the end of the world, according to Matthew 24, when they came to him and they said, tell us what shall be the sign of that coming and of the end of the world. So when the world, you know, you have people that say, well, these people are out there with signs and they're saying the end of the world's coming, the end of the world's coming. <clears throat> it is. The end of the world as we know it is coming. So after the tribulation, then we studied the millennium. How long is the millennium? <clears throat> thousand years. And some of the characteristics of the millennium, what's the one word that describes it? Peace. Peace. Peace will rule. Righteousness will rule. Christ Jesus, David, the disciples, Christians will rule and reign with the Lord on the earth when he sits on the earth and rules, as the scripture says, with a rod of iron. The animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, Everything's going to be restored to its once present beauty in the Garden of Eden, with the exception of the serpent. He'll still crawl on his belly. The sting of the animals taken up. The trouble in the animal kingdom, as the Bible says, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. They're in pain because of what man did. God's going to hit those switches and turn it all back to the way it was in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> of course, sin will still be here, though. That's the problem. Garden of Eden had no sin before the fall. There will be sin in the millennium, which will still cause disease, which will still cause death, but the lifespan will go a long, long time. <clears throat> and then after the thousand years are finished, that's where we're going to pick up this study. So up to this point, from the beginning, all the way to the end of the thousand year millennium, are there any looming questions? And anybody has. We covered a ton of information. <clears throat> Go ahead. One there. And I'll get yours in a second. <clears throat> yes. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I don't know if there will be, I don't know if there will be all that stuff where man still experiments with certain drugs and stuff, or will he just go pick a leaf off of a tree and it will work? Um, that seems to happen, I have to say, in the new heaven and new earth, okay? The millennium, it even gets better. It even gets better for the tree of life because in the beginning, and remember this, that's a good, good segue into the idea of the tree of life itself. The tree of life, the leaves, are for the healing of the nation. So the, the earth will bring forth its bounty in the millennium. But then when we get where the tree of life pops up again, and remember, you can't kill the tree of life. The tree of life always will be there. It's like the Ark of the Covenant. God knows where it is, and God will bring it back up. So the tree of life was in the beginning, and the tree of life shows up again in the book of Revelation. And the word freely is associated I believe with that. So you had a question as well. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Okay. The question is, will somebody make it the whole way through? Will they exceed Meth uh, Methuselah's age? That's a possibility that they could live the whole time. Yep. Yeah. Because a child will die at a hundred years old. So you think about the lifespan, you know, you have a child now, six, seven years old, maybe a child dying. If you multiply that times 10, that gives you 700. 
So if you take 100, multiply that times 10, the average, uh, and the reason I did that is because let's say a child is seven years old and dies, we would know that's a child times 10. <clears throat> Isn't that the Bible's 70 year? And if, and if by reason of strength, 80, we live to be 70, 80, that's our generation, our lifespan. But if we do that formula, we would take 100 being the age of a child and multiply that times 10, that gives you 1,000. So the probability of the happening is there that somebody could live past 1,000 years. Question here. Uh, it's always a good question with the Old Testament saints. That was something that plagued me for a long time when I was in Bible school. I never got a good answer as to when the Old Testament saints come up and are raptured. But if I was to take my best guess on the Old Testament saints, I would say they're going to come up with the tribulation saints at the end of the tribulation. So those souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and the Lord says, they say to the Lord, how long do we have to wait? And he says, he gives them a timing, and it's at the end of the tribulation. It looks as if the tribulation saints are going to be raptured or resurrected, if you will, resurrected at the end of the tribulation. And with that resurrection probably is the Old Testament saints. And the reason I say that is because the disciples, remember, and David are going to be resurrected for the millennium. So if they're going to be resurrected, and David's one of them, you would think that the Lord would say to the Old Testament saints, hey, you're going to be resurrected to enjoy the millennium. Does sound probable? That's, that's my best guess on the millennium for the Old Testament saints, because why would the Lord let them miss it? Okay, so we're talking about a resurrection of tribulation saints, a resurrection of Old Testament saints to go into the millennium and enjoy the Lord's bounty on the earth. Okay, any other questions? <clears throat> I'm going to... I'm going to go to Ezekiel. Are you reading the, the uh, I'm going, I'm going to some of that today. The dry bones, the dry bones will be those Jews that die in mass, mass executions in the tribulation. There will be a lot of bones that will, that will um, be tribulation saints. <clears throat> They'll be resurrected. Thought to on that was also. Herod killed those babies. He killed babies throughout the whole coast. Okay. Could they also be resurrected as the 144,000? That's an interesting thought too. So we have resurrection of dead bodies. That's why when we mourn for the dead, we need to understand what comforts us in mourning for the dead. What's the biggest comfort? Knowing that one day we will be reunited. So it's just a temporary stay. That's why when somebody dies, people that don't have the hope of, be, of the reuniting of that individual, you never, you never really are able to let the mourning go because you just always wonder. But when you know somebody has died that you love and you're going to meet with them again, that's where you can put it to rest and say, time will definitely heal this wound. It's just a matter of time. And really, when you think about time, doesn't it go so fast? One day you're going to be reunited with those that you love. Okay. Any other last minute questions here? Anything that's troubled you or you've thought about the millennium or about the tribulation or about the church? I hope I've done a good job in explaining this. If you want to, <clears throat> you can always go back and review it and you can listen to the studies because they're out there on the website. Bill? <clears throat> Yes. <clears throat> when you lose a Christian, you mean loses their inheritance? Yeah, or somebody you know, their and they suffer loss. <clears throat> They'll still go into the millennium, but they won't reign like someone who has lived for the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy. Enjoy life and hang around, but not have much responsibility. The responsibility level increases <clears throat> when you do more for the Lord now. So that's why the Lord wants you to live for him. And that's where you don't want to be short-sighted as well. Because a lot of people will say, well, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and that's enough. You're short-sighted. 
You need to be long-sighted. You need to think about the land that's far away, yes. But the Lord said that we're going to inherit that land. And the more you do for the Lord now, the greater position you're going to have in that land. And people may say, well, what's it matter? As the question was, I'll still get to enjoy all this. Yeah, but you get an opportunity to rule and reign with Christ, to have a position in this, in this kingdom of his. And if the Lord didn't think it was important, he wouldn't say to strive for it. He tells you strive for it, covet earnestly the best gifts, walk with Christ, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Always have to just keep things in perspective down here with an eye on the future, always. Okay. All right. With that, we're going to go ahead and move into now the new heaven and the new earth. Okay. Uh, this is eternity future. And it's a time after the millennium because it, there's a lot of confusion. And I get this a lot from questions. Okay, pastor, I understand the millennium. But it's the end of the millennium, and the, what then? Okay, so at the end of the millennium, what happens that causes it to come to an end? We said before, all ages and dispensations end in one word. And that word is apostasy. Every single one of them, including the millennium. And the reason they all end in apostasy is because man is a sinner. And there is sin in the world. And sin causes every generation to end in apostasy. Sin does. It just is so strong that man can't stay away from it. And it destroys man. And therefore, God has to do a reset every time with every dispensation. Every generation, God has to reset. And we're seeing that fastly coming in our world today. Sin is overtaking man. Righteousness is not prevailing. And you say, wow, but yeah, it's because sin is so powerful, okay? Even the millennium with Christ on the earth, sin gets the best. And the devil, this is what marks the end of the millennium. Beginning of the millennium, Satan is bound. He's bound for a thousand years, okay? The end of the millennium, he's let out. A thousand years are over, coming to an end. Satan is loosed. And he goes out to the four corners, quarters of the earth, and he gets a hold of Gog and Magog. This was your question. And he brings them together to battle against the Lord. Okay. And that is going to mark the end of the millennium. All right. So with that, we want to go ahead and get some passages. We want to get Ezekiel 38. And we want to get Revelation chapter 20. And I am so sorry for my cough in the morning. It, it happens to me. I, my allergies, especially this time of year, I just get uh, <clears throat> some congestion in my throat. Revelation chapter 20 and Ezekiel 38. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and get a cough drop real quick. <clears throat> These are helpful. <clears throat> All right, Ezekiel chapter 38 and Revelation chapter 20. So we look at Revelation chapter 20, and the scripture tells us in verse number one, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Okay, so that's the start of the millennium. He cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Okay, so a thousand years and, a, and probably a couple more months or little season, however long that lasts, he gets loosed. And then it says, Verse 4, we'll keep reading, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So
So there's people reigning with Christ. You got the tribulation, uh, uh, the tribulation saints there, those that are beheaded for the witness. You saw thrones. Okay, so you have your 12 disciples, you have David, you have all that I said, probably the Old Testament, because you got verse five, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were, were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the first resurrection actually has three different stages to it. There were the first fruits, there's the harvest, and then there will be the gleanings, okay? Who made, uh, I'm going to throw this out to you because I want, I want that hamster in the wheel to get rolling and for you to, you to start thinking here. Who were the first fruits? First fruits go back before our time now, right? So that means the first fruits already went out. Okay, when did they go out? The resurrection of Christ, which we just, we just passed. We had our resurrection service last week. So in honor of that, we think about that time. The Bible says that when Christ was on the cross, the graves of people were opened. And they didn't come out until his resurrection. So the resurrection of Christ started this. Not only did he resurrect, but the bodies of the saints which slept arose and were seen throughout the holy city. Christ, them, and the ones in paradise the first fruits of them that slept. Got it? So the first resurrection starts with that. That's the first fruits. And if you, if you have a garden, you understand this. The first fruits that come out are the ones that you wait for so earnestly, right? There's those tomatoes and they're all green and you're waiting for them to turn red because you're just, me and Nadine do this all the time. Nadine. I've been out there in the garden and that green, big green tomato is starting to turn pink. Oh, dad, when are we going to eat it? And we'll get that and I'll pick it. And we slice that thing and she stares at that tomato. And I, as I'm cutting it, I look at her and we get the olive oil out and you pour it on there and it's on that plate. And then you salt it, you know, and you get your bread and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> And then it's like there's only one tomato to go around. And you just slowly eat that. And boy, the juice from that time you say the first fruits. And then all of a sudden, all these tomatoes start coming. What's that called? That's the harvest. Okay, so if the first resurrection has three parts, what's the harvest? The harvest is the rapture. The church. The harvest. Then you have the latter part. When you're sick and tired of tomatoes and you've eaten them until they're coming out your nostrils, you still say, oh, there's some left. Let's give them to the neighbors. Now all of a sudden you become benevolent. Yeah, hey, let's take them to the church and give them to the church. Yeah, these are these tomatoes. Oh, you glutton, you've been eating all those tomatoes and you're sick and tired of them and here they are. Okay, those are the gleanings. The gleanings are the tribulation saints. And that ends the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. This is why I'm putting the Old Testament saints in with the first resurrection, because they're blessed. Okay? But the second resurrection doesn't happen till a thousand. This is where the confusion comes with Christians. They can't understand the timing of this. First resurrection has three parts. It encompasses about 2,000 years. And then you got a thousand year gap, millennium. The end of the millennium now is the second resurrection. You got those times? Everyone got that? Please seal that in your mind because that has been a real source of confusion with the church uh, people that I, I have ministered to over the years because people ask me that question all the time. Okay, so then we get down to verse number six. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. And I think that first and second confuses people a lot too. But the second death hath no power. And isn't that a blessing when you think the second death has no power over you? No power over you. <clears throat> but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. 
All right, so now let's fast forward. And when the thousand years are expired, <clears throat> Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, <clears throat> Gog and Magog, gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, what do you see in there? What do you see in there? You see a bunch of people that are kind of just laying low, waiting for the devil to come back, waiting for their wicked agenda again. So you got man in the millennium being suppressed by God's reign. And deep in his heart, he doesn't like it. And he's more than willing when the devil shows up to go the way of the devil. Now, you could think positive or negative, you, whatever you want about man. But this tells us all we need to know about human nature. It tells us that human nature, physical, fleshly man, would rather, I'm going to say something here that I believe to be fact, would rather choose the way of the devil than the way of God. You agree? If he gathers them together to battle, who are they going to go fight? God. Who are they following? They're following the devil. He's going to get them together. The number of whom is what? As the sand of the sea. What a great multitude this must be. That is willing to march up against God. To say we no longer want you to be in charge. That's how powerful fleshly nature can be. And I'll tell you what, we all know it, don't we? Because we all feel it every day, don't we? And we all fight it every day. And sometimes it really gets the best of us. And we find ourselves giving into it because it's strong. It's strong. And I've often said this and believe it with my whole heart. Of the three, and no, with all due respect to the devil, because Satan is very strong. But the flesh is the strongest. That flesh is just wicked. Wicked. The devil gets us because he gets us through the flesh. He's the tempter. He tempts your flesh. He tempts you with what you like. Throw some things out. What do we like? What do we like? Food? What do we like? That was a consensus. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Think beyond your belly. But doesn't that go with whose God is their belly? And doesn't the Bible say that? What else? What do we like? Entertainment. Doesn't that get us? <clears throat> what? Who said what? guns okay men like guns nothing wrong with liking guns nothing wrong with guns it's not guns that kill people it's people that kill people they just have a easier way to kill somebody okay what else what do we like nature is nature bad but can it corrupt a person yeah you can bow down to a statue or a wood or a fish Little Justin caught a 41 and a half inch muskie yesterday and put a plug up. Absolutely gigantic fish. Gigantic. We could have all said, hail big muskie. <clears throat> and worship that muskie. You know, it, it was huge. Fish of a lifetime. That's what nature is intended. Go out fish, but don't worship the fish. What else? What do we like? Huh? That's food. We like sin. Sin's the, sin's the basket of everything. But within that basket, you've got money, sports, sleep, sleep, <clears throat> sleep. Amen. Let's park it there for a little bit. That keeps us from Sunday school, doesn't it? Sleep sometimes. Oh, but you don't understand, Pastor. It's my only day off. And I was up all night, you know. <clears throat> it's hard for me. 
hard for me too. It's hard for me. Sleep. Women like men. Men like women. Women like clothes. Men like men like possessions. Okay, so you say all those things. Yes, all those things. Those are fleshly lusts. And they, the Bible says they war against the soul. Okay, <clears throat> so my point is the devil offers those things. And men think that God doesn't have their best interest in mind because he doesn't let them do those things. You can still do things, but God doesn't want you to embrace them and love them more than him, right? Isn't that how it works? Lust is all around us. Lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. That's the problem. Okay? So the devil rounds up everyone. I'll give you what you want. Follow me and let's overthrow the Jewish dictator. Let's march against him. End of the millennium. Yes. Yes. I'm going to, she had asked that question. I'm going to go to Ezekiel. And that's probably all the time that we'll have once we go there. But I'm doing this slowly because I'm enjoying this as I go along. And I'm actually, I got to say to you, I'm actually digging very deep to learn more about all of this myself. Because we don't know all the future. We can look at the past and understand the past. But the future is a little cloudy to us. But yet, we have a prophetic mind in Christ, okay? So here we go. It says in verse number uh, eight, <clears throat> it shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. Now, God only gives two verses to this, really. It's over quickly, isn't it? And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil, now this is what I read yesterday and this was an interesting thought. The fire of God comes down and devours them. They're all over the earth, but they're encompassed around the holy city. So if it devours them, how doesn't it devour all the other inhabitants that are around? I've often thought that they just come up around the city and the fire of God <clears throat> just is unleashed upon each of them and kind of turns them into char and ashes right before the eyes of everybody else, kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah. But the Lord didn't want anybody to look on Sodom and Gomorrah, did he? So you think about the judgment of God and fire coming down from heaven. God might not want anybody to look on what he's going to do. So how can he do this? And that's what I thought yesterday. And I'm going to give you my thought here in a second after I take this question. Go ahead. That's right. So how is God going to take the righteous away from them? This is interesting because when you get to the next verse, you see this happen kind of like this. You get... 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire. Okay? All of a sudden, he's gone. It says, and, brim, and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw the great white throne. Boom. It just happened. So here's my thought upon reading some of Clarence Larkin yesterday. Clarence Larkin indicates here, and some of the others did too, in reading them, and I'm kind of favoring this opinion. That at this particular moment, here they come. God's going to end the millennium and he's going to do it with quick force. And what he does here is before he sends the fire of God down, he pulls the righteous up. Okay. What happens here is before the fire of God falls, the indication here is, is that the righteous are taken up. And all of a sudden, the devil's cast, 
and there's a great white throne. It seems like God unleashes his fury of fire upon the whole earth. And he does it with this beginning here, right here. Because the Bible says that the earth and the heavens, as we know, shall be dissolved with a fervent heat. And everybody is coming off the earth. Every body that's ever been on earth will go up to the great white throne. There will be nothing left here. Not one soul, not one body will be on the earth when God annihilates it with fire. Everyone understand that. So the thought here is, this moment right here begins the great white throne judgment. And God unleashes his fire upon them and consumes their bodies and their souls and their bodies that were just consumed meet them up there to be judged at the great white throne. Now, the feeling is, if their bodies are turned into ash, how are they going to be up there again? Here's the thing. And I have explained this a thousand times if I've explained it once, but I understand this is tough stuff. Let's take the body of somebody famous. Let's take the body of, <clears throat> let's go back in time, someone who's been dead for a long time, a famous person. Throw one out. I was thinking George Washington. Who else? King Tut. That's a good one. He's been dead for a long time. King Tut. Let's say King Tut. Yeah. King Tut's body. And let's say he's, let's say King Tut isn't going to be raptured out because he was a non-believer. Let's just say he's a non-believer. I don't know him. I don't know what he believed. Okay. But probably pretty sure he was a non-believer. Let's just say he was. That means that his particles are somewhere on the earth. He's turned to dust. Well, they found his body. Okay. My point. If a body has been completely destroyed and gone and nobody can see any fragments, let's say somebody was eaten by a shark and went through the canal of the shark and became waste. Where are they? God knows. God's going to take every one of their molecules and put them back together. And they're going to go up to the great white throne. All right. This is where I'm going to go next week. I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to go to Gog and Magog right now. I'm going to talk about the great white throne and how God piece by piece is going to put everybody back together. And their body is going to stand with their soul and be judged before God. Okay. And I'll give you every verse that applies to that. Okay. Now, without further delay, your question on Gog and Magog. He gathers them together. Fire of God comes down and consumes them. So who are Gog and Magog? With that, we have to go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38. <clears throat> if I said Gog... And Magog today, who do you think of immediately? Think of Russia. You think of Russia, you think of China, you think of those areas north of the Caucasus. You would think of the Caucasians. Okay. You would think of white folks because we're Caucasians. We come, white people, from the Caucasus. That's why they're called Caucasians. They're the northern part above Israel, up there in the Caucasus Mountains. That area there is the home of Gog and Magog. When you look at the word Gentile in the Bible, the Lord, this is weird. This is really weird. The Lord uses the word Gentile specifically for the sons of Japheth, not the sons of Ham. Even though Ham and those black folks around the world are Gentiles, God, when he says Gentiles in the book of Genesis, refers to the sons of Japheth, which are white folks. So the power of the Gentiles, the islands of the Gentiles, okay, lies in Japheth. Okay. The Antichrist knows this. The devil knows this. So what he does is he stirs up that area that loves to make war. He stirs them up. Where's the war today? 
It's right in that area. Who is Gog? If we were going to stop, and let's say right now, let's stop this right. Who is Gog? Everyone in here is telling me Russia. Gog is a person. He's a person. So Gog is the leader of Magog. Okay, who is Gog? Putin. If it were to stop right now, Putin is Gog. G-O-G. -G. Okay, there was a question. Somebody had a hand up real quick. China is not. They're not. You said China is not, Japheth? China is Shem. Okay. Uh, but they're Gentiles still. But Japheth, and Russia's kind of unique in this because if you move through Russia, which has, I believe, one, what is it, one sixth or one eighth of all the land in the world, if you move across to the, to the eastern part, you're going to get a mix of Shem and Japheth, okay? But when God talks of Gentiles, and you'll read this in Genesis, you can read it, he'll say Japheth, they Gentiles, and he puts the word Gentile right with them. He doesn't do that with him, and he doesn't do that with Shem. So there's a little nugget in there, something in that thing. And the Antichrist is like unto a leopard. And this is interesting to know. It has black spots representative of Ham. It has a yellow fur, representative of Shem. It has white, but the white on a leopard is not throughout the top of the body. It's under the belly. And the force of a person is in their navel. Job, Leviathan's force, behemoth, in their navel, right here in the belly. You want to be strong for your life? Don't build your biceps. What do you build? You build here. This is where your strength is, right here, okay? So for you aspiring young men, want to be strong and have a good back the rest of your life? A lot of people's backs go bad because their abdomen muscles are weak. Strengthen these and you'll strengthen your back. You won't throw those discs because this is strong, okay? It's important. God gives you a way to live and he even tells you how to lift what to strengthen. See, men is really, they want to impress those girls, don't they? I'm not a very good model up here. I'm not a very good model. I have very thin arms and legs. I'm not a good model. We need Pietro or George to get up here. You know, oh man, well, that's what I want to be. But this is what you want to be right here. You want to build that core, strengthen your core. That's where the strength lies. The strength of that leopard is in his belly, Japheth, white, okay? Gentile, underneath there. It's nothing against the other races. See, people listen and say, oh, he's a racist. It's nothing against it. The beast is made up of the three. They all three play a part. Just because you say the strength lies in the belly doesn't mean the other two are weak. They all have their, they all have their, Pros and cons, if you will. Anyway, Gog, Magog. Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38. <clears throat> it says, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against who? Gog. Look, the land of Magog. The chief prince. It's a person. I used to read it and think Gog was the land. Gog is the person, the ruler, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against who? Him. And say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog. It's close to God, isn't it? O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws. <clears throat> now, who does he put hooks in? Whose jaws in the Bible? Leviathan, Job 41. So we got a link between the ruler of Gog and a link between Leviathan. Okay? Interesting stuff. I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, 
horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them. See? Who's the leader, though? It's Gog. But he gets strength from Africa. He gets, there's Ethiopia, Libya. That's Africa. He gets strength from Persia. Persia, reviving the old Babylonian and Persian empires. Okay? With them, all of them was with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee and be thou a guard unto them. Let's look in verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know when I, have, I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? And it shall come to pass. I like this verse a lot. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. <clears throat> wow. All of a sudden, God's going to go, oh. I've had it. My fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood and will rain upon him and upon his band and upon the many people that are with him and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, what do we have today? We've got Russia, Putin, aligning with who? China. You see, China has not condemned them. You know that? China is supporting them, giving them food. China, on the back end, is providing them what they need to keep this thing going. They're already aligning. You say, yeah, but that's not for another thousand years. It's just a precursor of what they're going to do then. When the Lord comes back in Armageddon, the devil's going to use them first. And then he's going to say when he comes out, I remember who my, who my foes, or I remember who my, who my friends were. I'm going to go get them again. They'll come with me. And he brings them back. Got it? Okay. This, a lot was thrown out today. One last question. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and turn this off for those that are on Zoom.